Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Robert McDonald, a professor of history at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and the author of the forthcoming Confounding Father, Thomas Jefferson's Image in His Own Time. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Rob. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. So this is – we're going to talk mostly about Jefferson today and sort of the founding era, but that's your your big passion is for Jefferson. Uh, I think your son is named Jefferson, correct? Yeah, that is true. Um, <laughs> so, so he's not he's not lying. He you know, he put his money where his mouth. My, my, my wife and I met at Monticello. Um I, I got my job teaching at West Point. Oh, and I'm supposed to say, by the way, my, my views don't necessarily represent those. The, the, the US States military. military <laughs> but uh yeah, I, I I got my job teaching at West Point. It was fantastic, but I was um uh, single and um there isn't a great dating scene at the United States Military <laughs> Academy for professors and uh and I met my wife, uh, who was a researcher at Monticello, the following summer. I got a research fellowship, and my joke is uh, she's the the first and last person upon my uh, upon whom my I study Thomas Jefferson pickup line actually worked. And uh, yeah, so. I, I guess yeah, <laughs> that, that's probably good. Monticello is a good place to right. meet women. Like that's that. right. That's right. Excellent. So why are we so fascinated with Thomas Jefferson? Do you think? I think there there are a lot of different reasons why a person might be fascinated by Thomas Jefferson. I mean, Thomas Jefferson was a true polymath. He was a person who um, was interested in a lot of different things, and he was able to develop um, specialized uh, knowledge and expertise in a lot of different fields. Um, Jefferson, of course, was a statesman. Um, but he was an architect. Uh, he was a musician. He was. What did he play? He played the the, the violin or the fiddle. I'm, pict um, I'm picturing like a Sherlock Holmes kind of playing the violin. <laughs> <laughs> like but he, kind of, he and really his family, out. they'd have you know jam sessions, and that's how he courted his his wife. I mean, I think she was you know very impressed by um, his his ability. Um, well, this is why I, this is, so it's always been the case. You pick up the right. guitar or the string instrument right, to pick right. up women. So yeah. he's, he's the other guy who the Jefferson pickup line worked for. I, I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. Um, yeah, or he, he could just play uh, play that violin really, really well. Um, so, you know, he, he's a, a, in, in many ways uh, somebody who thought deeply um, but also broadly. And um, I, I admire that. I also admire, you know, Jefferson's statements about – Liberty, and um, I, that that is the source of my initial fascination. But it doesn't take long um, once you start reading about Thomas Jefferson to realize that his deeds didn't always measure up to his words, um, and he lived as we do in a complicated time, um, oftentimes where uh, principles will compete with one another. Um, you know, on one side of an equation, a certain set of principles um, might be in the balance, but but there are other principles that are competing with those. Um, and seeing him deal with those conflicts, I think, is really fascinating. Um, another thing that's fascinating about Jefferson is, is that he was in an era where the rules of political engagement were very much in flux. And the way politics were practiced in 1776, um, they weren't practiced the same way 50 years later. And he's in the middle of that transition and how he grapples with those, uh, you know, changing rules – as sort of a political athlete, I think is is fascinating as well. What does that change look like? So, where what was it? What were we transitioning from and towards that sure. he was in the middle of? Yeah. So, in in many respects, uh, during the colonial era, America is still uh, an aristocratic society, and we have politics that emphasize things like the deference of um, the public toward the people they entrust with positions of of power. Um, people who stand for office. I almost said run for office, but no one does that in the, in the 18th century. You, you uh, don't I'm campaign, just, right? I'm, I'm now I'm, it's kind of – can I – I'll forego the dentistry and the antibiotics and just go to back <laughs> to a time where no one's running for office. So, so, so people might realize that they are candidates for office, that they are being put forth for office. But by no means will they campaign and say, if you vote for me, I will do this for you. I mean that was uh, considered to be the definition of corruption. Voters in the 18th century largely were uh, entrusted to assess the characters of the, the people who stood for office and, and to judge the wisdom of someone, the um, impartiality of someone, the ability of someone to make a sound um, decision based on what, what was, you know, what was the just thing to do? What was the right thing to do? And once you entrusted that person with power, the ethic was that you were going to, uh, you know, preserve that trust and allow them to make the decisions that they wish to make. Um, 
things get much more democratic with a small d during the course of Jefferson's lifetime. Politics become much more competitive as a result of um, the fact that we have this new government under the Constitution. We have people like Alexander Hamilton um, who are arguing for essentially an expansion of federal power during the Washington administration. And people like Jefferson and his chief ally, James Madison, um, arguing for a more strict interpretation of, of the Constitution. Hamilton and, and his party, if you want to call it that, the Federalists, are going to increasingly do battle with Jefferson and Madison and their party, the, the Republicans. And uh, a lot is at stake. I mean, the future of America is at stake. And Jefferson and Madison, in, in some respects, view Hamilton and Adams and other Federalists as counter-revolutionaries who are you know, going against the spirit of 76 and want to roll back all the progress that has been made and you know, fought for at great cost to, to you know, people's lives and fortunes. And, and yet Hamilton, I think he views his project as consolidating this new nation that he and Washington um, have helped to establish and secure. And the fear of the Federalists is that Jefferson and Madison might in fact be more like French revolutionaries than American revolutionaries. And they were kind of fans of the French Revolution. At least Jefferson was a pretty big fan of that. He was there right when it started to happen. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and, and who wouldn't be a fan? I mean, you know, in, in this world uh, where the new United States has uh, the geopolitical significance of a fairly minor country, you know, France and Britain are the, the world's two great superpowers. And to see one of them uh, turn away from absolutism and, and apparently embrace liberty and fraternity and equality, I mean, that's, that's, that's quite uh, a wonderful development. And it makes the American revolutionaries feel as if their ideas are spreading. So how does someone like Jefferson get to revolution? Because, I mean, so we at the Cato Institute gripe about the state of government – all the time. But I haven't uh, taken up arms right, yet. We're pretty down <laughs> on it and, and a lot of our complaints, I mean in a lot of ways we think it's it's worse today than it was when the colonies decided to rebel. Um, and But we don't – no one seems – no matter how mad people seem to get about politics, it, it doesn't ever jump to, OK, let's take up arms or let's strike out on our own. And that's – I mean so it's a big jump. So how do you get there? Or even let's take up arms against the most powerful military on the planet, which at the time was the British and would be the American sure. government. So that, that seems also crazy. Well, you know, in, in a way it was crazy. Um, but in another way, they thought that it would be crazy not to. Um, and, and, and I'll make the problem even more complicated. Sure, Britain was the most powerful nation on the planet, especially after the Seven Years' War. That, that, that was pretty clear. It was also the richest and what's more, it was also the freest. I mean Britain and – and I don't think that those two things are unrelated by the way. Um, freedom and prosperity and power, I think you could argue go hand in hand and uh, to, to decide to divorce America from Great Britain – was not an easy decision to make and it wasn't one that was made at the spur of the moment. I mean there is a long in extended imperial crisis that really begins in the aftermath of the French and Indian War, this war that um, the British win um, and yet it causes the British to du double their deficit – I'm sorry, their, their debt um, doubles during the course of the French and Indian War known globally as the Seven Years' War. Um, the British would like to avoid a future expense of war and so they draw the proclamation line of 1763 telling the colonists that they can't settle west of the Appalachian Mountains. They also look no, for no, – What was that? That was to keep them out of conflict? It was – yeah, exactly. It was to keep them out of conflict with the Native Americans. I mean the French military is vanquished from North America after you know the French and Indian War as the Seven Years' War is known. But the Native Americans who were the allies largely of the French, they're still here. And the British wanting to avoid a future expense of war realized that colonists, if they move west, are going to come into conflict with those Indian nations. And you know, good fences make good neighbors. That's essentially their thought. Um, they also think that maybe it's time to start raising some revenue from the colonists. So the, the, the Stamp Act is passed, um, followed by the Townsend duties. These, these taxes were um, – not all that burdensome upon the colonists and yet the colonists, they weren't represented in parliament. They had their own legislatures. They had in Virginia the House of Burgesses or you know, the Massachusetts Assembly or what have you. Um, they understood that 
they could be taxed by those local assemblies. But to be, you know, when people, what do we call it when someone takes your money without asking? Theft. Yeah, it's stealing, right? So um, it, parliament can't ask them. There's no one to ask in parliament. They haven't consented um, to the election of members of parliament. So they view that as theft. And the, the whole point of government, you know, as, as good British people believe in the 18th century, as John Locke says when he explains the glorious revolution of 1688, that's legitimate because government's function is to protect life and liberty and property. And if government is not protecting their property but instead stealing their property, it's not doing the job of government. And uh, if government is sending troops to live among them, as the British government does when they arrive in Boston, if those troops uh, are leaving Boston and going out to Lexington um, on their way to Concord to, to take their weapons away, um, it's, it's imposing tyranny upon them. The, when, when the British government in response to the Boston Tea Party in 1773 and uh, a couple months later, it, it, it passes what the British government calls the Coercive Acts, what the colonists called the Intolerable Acts, shutting down Boston Harbor, um, banning their, their local town meetings, preventing the Massachusetts Assembly from meeting. Um, you know, what Patrick Henry down in Virginia said is we're in a state of nature. It, it's like there isn't a government. It's, it's as if the British have declared independence from us because they're not performing those essential functions, the protection of life and liberty and property that government is supposed to protect. So how did Jefferson himself experience those? Like where was he at those times? How did he get revolutionized um, and, and radicalized, I guess would be the term now. He, he, at some point, he decided it was time to break away. But what was his thought process like? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think in, in some respects, Jefferson is born at just the right time to be a revolutionary. Um, you know, he comes of age uh, as a young man in Williamsburg, as a student at the College of William and Mary. Um, he is mentored by uh, George Wythe, who's a noted, you know, Virginia jurist and a professor of law at William and Mary. Um, he's he's uh, fully immersed in the principles of British liberty um, and law and constitutionalism, and so it's it's very clear to Jefferson, as it's clear to to other political thinkers in America, as as it's clear, I think, to many Americans, uh, regular Americans. That you know what we thought the British government stood for, the British government no longer stands for, and the liberties that we thought were guaranteed to us as Englishmen um, are now in jeopardy. And if we really value these liberties, if we really want to preserve our rights, it's not going to be under the authority of the British government. It's only going to be if we seize authority for ourselves and declare independence. And of course, Jefferson writes the Declaration of Independence, which is right. Why was he? Why was he chosen for that? Of all the people at the Continental Congress? Yeah, right. So I mean, it, it seems an unlikely choice. Jefferson's thirty-three years old. He's one of the youngest members. He's he's fairly obscure. He's not among the more well-known. The the committee um, that is selected by the Congress to draft a declaration includes him probably because he's a Virginian. Um, they were looking for some. Geographical diversity. You have Ben Franklin, you know, the most famous member of the Continental Congress from Pennsylvania. There's John Adams from Massachusetts, Roger Sherman from Connecticut, Robert Livingston from New York. Um, Jefferson thinks John Adams should write the Declaration. And Adams has been a, a strong advocate for independence for months. Um, but according to Adams, when Jefferson makes that suggestion, Adams responds that there are three reasons why Jefferson should do it. He said, um, number one, you're a Virginian and a Virginian ought to be at the head of this business. In other words, the blood of people from Massachusetts had been spilled, right? New Englanders were very much uh, involved in, in the war for independence that began in 1775. New England had lots of skin in the game, but a Virginian perhaps could uh, cause other delegates to the, the, to the Congress to see this truly as a continental struggle. Um, in addition, Adams said, you could write 10 times better than I can. Um, Just kind of interesting because Adams was not a humble person. He wasn't a humble person and he wasn't a bad writer. He was a great writer. So that's a great compliment. Um, the, the other one he paid was sort of uh, – uh, he was being quite humble um, when he said, I, John Adams, am obnoxious, suspected, and unpopular. <laughs> and you are very much otherwise. And uh, I think he meant that he was obnoxious in, in pursuing independence, um, that, that maybe – people were tired of hearing his arguments within the Continental Congress and that Jefferson would bring sort of a freshness to this process that might be beneficial. 
On the declaration, I mean one of the things we recently had episodes with our colleague Roger Pilon and just yesterday we recorded an episode with uh, legal scholar Randy Barnett and both of them made the argument that the the declaration, the opening of the declaration contains kind of the core founding political philosophy of the United States and that it's, there's a very coherent argument about the origins of legitimacy of governments and um, and how that legitimacy operates. Is that is that representative? So was that conscious? Was Jefferson setting out to articulate a coherent political philosophy from which to then derive the need for a new system of government? Um, and if he was, how shared was that? Is there such a thing as like this is the the core founding idea or principles of America, or was this more? His thing, and everyone else was like, "Okay, you know, what really we're really concerned about is the litany of abuses and why we should rebel." Yeah, Jefferson later wrote that he wrote the Declaration to be an expression of the American mind. And when you think about it, this is a corporate document, right? This is a, a, a statement made in behalf of the Continental Congress. And when finally New York would receive instructions to vote for independence and the declaration was inscribed on parchment, it was described as the unanimous declaration of the United States of, of, of America. Um, so it's not Jefferson's opinion. This is a, a, a shared opinion. And he's trying to, in, in some ways, ventriloquize the American people. We know that not all Americans supported independence. Adams guessed that about a third were still loyalists, maybe a third sat on the fence. Um, but this was designed to try to cause Americans to rally around that, that, that proposition. And when you think about it, you know, Jefferson has essentially two tests of legitimacy. Um, everyone knows the famous, you know, sentence about how all men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What follows is the statement that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So there are two tests of legitimacy. Uh, to be legitimate, a government has to secure these rights. And it also has to derive uh, its powers, its just powers from the consent of the governed. So a government that, that protects people's individual rights and is based upon their consent, if those two things are present, it's legitimate. What Jefferson is arguing is that for the colonists, um, soon to be you know, free, independent Americans, um, their rights are not being secured and their consent is not being sought. They don't have the representation um, that would render government in America legitimate. Do we know or do you know I, – I, I actually have never encountered this in all my historical reading – how the declaration was delivered to the king? I mean, do, I, mean do we, we, I think there's some things about what the king said when he read it. But did, we, did they you know, make a copy and put it on a ship and say take this to the king or anything or did they just let him find out himself or do you know? Yeah, well, I mean, the declaration says that uh, a decent respect for the opinions of mankind um, is one of the things that that brings about the need to to make this declaration. George the Third is is a, a, you know a, a member of mankind. I'm sure he is. Uh, one of the people who reads it, he has a compelling interest in it, but he rejects it, of course. He's been rejecting all of their petitions. All, all the branches. So yeah, yeah. The, the olive branch petition from a year earlier is something that, that he essentially didn't even think it was necessary to issue a response because he didn't recognize the legitimacy of the Continental Congress. Oh, interesting. Now, during the war, Jefferson, does he – pick up a gun at all or is he doing other things during the war? So uh, Jefferson, like John Adams, uh, is is someone who's going to leave Philadelphia after the declaration is is passed. Um, you know, not immediately, but but shortly thereafter. And Adams goes back to Massachusetts and he helps to write the Constitution. Jefferson goes back to Virginia. Um, he helps the Massachusetts Constitution. Right. That's right. Yeah. Which, which in fact, our Constitution you yeah. know, is, is in some ways modeled. But uh, Jefferson goes back to Virginia. He reforms the laws of Virginia. I mean, this is a, an amazing moment of – of creativity. I mean, this is an opportunity for people in all of the 13 state capitals uh, to make things right, um, to throw off the the, the yoke of, of British government under which they had um, been forced uh, to, to labor and to, to republicanize, you know, with a small r, to republicanize 
their their laws and their constitutions. Jefferson is going to serve as the wartime governor of, of Virginia. Um, so uh, for, for two years, uh, including uh, when Virginia is invaded by the British, um, Jefferson will be the governor. He'll uh, relocate the capital to Richmond in part because he thinks it's a more defensible location than Williamsburg. Um, that's probably true, but it wasn't defensible enough. The British take Richmond. Um, the uh, Virginia Assembly uh, ret retreats inland. They meet for a while in, in Charlottesville, Jefferson's hometown. Um, as the British march west, Jefferson uh, sends the legislature to Stanton, Virginia, further to the west. Um, he could see through his handheld uh, telescope the British coming. From, from um, Monticello. Yeah. I mean, he's standing on top of Monticello. Uh, Virginia has its own Paul Revere, a guy named Jack Jewett, who, uh, who um, you know, alerts people that the British are on their way. Um, Jefferson doesn't waste uh, too much time as the British are at the foot of his little mountain. Um, he mounts his horse and rides away. He's not going to be captured. He's nobody fool. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the closest he ever comes to combat. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, he's, he's very much in the thick of things. Now, Monticello, when did – he was born – Close, but not on Monticello, correct? That's right. Yeah. So his father's uh, plantation is called Shadwell, and it's uh, on property that Jefferson inherited. That's essentially at the base of of the mountain. Um, you know, he incre Jefferson increases his his land holdings. Building Monticello on top of a mountain, building a house on top of a mountain, is a somewhat impractical thing to do. Um, you know, there are a lot of practical uh, considerations that that would mitigate against that um, or militate against that. The idea that you know, bringing up water or supplies. Um, but it's a very practical location for Jefferson at the moment that the British are coming because, you know, he has the high ground and, and he could see them. I, on Monticello, I'm, how did he get involved in – so he, he was the architect of it. Yes. And so I just earlier this year visited Monticello for the first time um, and had – shortly before that been to Mount Vernon with my daughter on a field trip and it's striking how different the two homes are and how much Jefferson's home feels modern and feels – it feels much more like the kind of place you'd want to live than Washington's home um, and, and it's so – it's just so radically different from what was common at the time but at the same time like most people, if you're like, I'm going to be, an, I'm going to design my own home. Um, I'm going to be an amateur architect. We'd say that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> right. Uh, so how does how does he get just involved in doing that? And where does that that sense of, I mean, just feels very contemporary to us come from? So yeah, Jefferson described Monticello as his essay in architecture, and uh, I think it is an essay in that. Uh, the, the rooms work together. They fit together almost like the, the, the paragraphs in a finely crafted essay. And the house has a flow to it um, and an energy to it. Um, and, and you're right. It has uh, sort of a modern sensibility to it. It has skylights. Yeah, it feels so very house, spacious and light. With skylights. Way, yeah. It's fantastic. And, and uh, you know, it's an interesting house and uh, Jefferson wrote a lot about it, but there's a lot that's left unsaid. It's, it's interesting because when, when you took the tour and entered, uh, you entered through uh, the side that most people would enter Monticello when Jefferson lived there, the east front. And if you stand on the, uh, the steps of the portico there and you look um, to the east, you, you have what Jefferson called his sea view because you look into the – the land, the flat land that goes out toward Richmond and Williamsburg and um, it kind of disappears in this bluish haze. It almost looks like you're looking at the ocean and you're looking back at civilization because Monticello is built essentially on the edge of the wilderness. And when you walk into um, that eastern side of the house, you're um, confronted with uh, a bunch of artifacts from the American West. Um, Lewis and Clark uh, brought back, you know, the mounted antlers of, of various animals and Indian artifacts, um, na you know, Native American objects that were put on display. Um, the room that is opposite that on the western side of the house, you know, this is the front of the house that's on the nickel, um, is, is a room that in some ways, very much brings the East to the West. It brings Western civilization to the American frontier. 
And Jefferson has hanging on the walls of his parlor um, a number of portraits of, of great Enlightenment thinkers, including the, the three he called his uh, trinity of mortals. Uh, there was Bacon and Newton and Locke. Um, there are portraits of Washington and Benjamin Franklin um, and others. And, uh, and yet from that side of the house, when you, when you look out, you take in the vista of the Blue Ridge Mountains and all that is beyond, which I think for Jefferson was really the future. During uh, – after the Continental Congress, he – but a lot of people don't realize I, I often – when I teach, I uh, have to correct people and say that Jefferson was not at the Constitutional Convention. Um, he had no direct hand in writing the Constitution. Uh, where was he during that time? Uh, and then also, do we have any idea what he thought of the Constitution, at least – Immediately after when he heard about it and, and read it and what his idea of whether that was a good a good constitution. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, so Jefferson, of course, uh, had uh, he was the person who uh, succeeded Benjamin Franklin as our ambassador to France. People in France, someone sometimes said to Jefferson, "Oh, you are Franklin's replacement." They loved Franklin, by the way, and Jefferson really ingratiated himself to them by saying, "No one can replace Franklin. I am merely his his successor." Well, Franklin loved being in France. Yes, too. he did. Bon, yes, he did. bon vivant is a good word for what he did when he was there. And and Jefferson did too. I mean, interestingly, I mean, he 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 is a man uh, very much of Virginia, and in some ways, his sensibilities are very provincial. He thinks very highly of Virginia, but he's thrilled to be in France and to be exposed to the culture and uh, the knowledge of Enlightenment Europe. Sure. Um, he's in correspondence with James Madison uh, throughout his time in France. And, you know, Madison, of course, you know, the father of the Constitution is decisively engaged in the process of shaping that document. And ultimately, he's going to send a copy of it to Thomas Jefferson and Jefferson reads it and, uh, you know, he writes back to Madison that he thinks it's, it's fantastic. He's done a, an excellent job and he's very pleased with this and he hopes that it will be ratified. He has two principal objections to it. Um, one is that uh, the president originally was uh, perpetually reelectable. And Jefferson really feared that we would uh, develop a tradition where our presidents were presidents for life. So he called for um, some sort of amendment that would limit uh, the president's time in office. Um, the, the other thing that Jefferson objected to was initially the Constitution lacked a Bill of Rights and he hoped that a Bill of Rights would be added. Um, so both of Jefferson's uh, objections, frankly, have been have been answered. Um, you know, we, we now do limit the president's time in office, and we do have uh, a Bill of Rights. Um, you know, that was added in 1791. So I think you could say um, you could make the claim at least that through his association with Madison and and because of his influence upon Madison, um, he helped to shape the Constitution as well. You mentioned this uh, earlier. We we're talking about the politics that emerged after the Constitution was ratified. Right. Uh, what is Jefferson's role in the in the new government uh, when it takes over? And then if you could elaborate a little bit on that debate that starts emerging between uh, – would it, would it be safe to say that Jefferson hated Alexander Hamilton by the end? I mean, I, 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 like to put up – I've always wondered that. Um, and then how did that develop? Hate's a strong word. Um, I, but but maybe in this case it would apply. I think you could certainly say that that Alexander Hamilton um, hated Thomas Jefferson. Uh, you, you know the, the the book that I'm um, that I've finished that is just coming out it's called Confounding Father. One of the reasons that Jefferson is a confounding father in the eyes of Americans is that opinions of him are so divided. The book is really about um, this dual image of Thomas Jefferson that begins to emerge in the 1790s when Jefferson becomes a member of Washington's administration as Secretary of State. Hamilton, of course, is Secretary of the Treasury. And initially, uh, Hamilton will start to propose uh, measures that Jefferson um, is, is hesitant about. Soon he's going to become outright hostile to him. He thinks that Hamilton is, is hatching a plan um, that is counter-revolutionary in nature, that, that is going to make the United States government unlike uh, the way that it was set out to be in the Constitution, that will cause it to become more like the British government. Um, Hamilton, for example, proposes a national bank that's not explicitly authorized in the Constitution. And Jefferson and Madison, too, are going to you know, take up the charge against Hamilton's measures. Um, and that leads to a bunch of um, fights in the newspapers. Uh, Hamilton will try to describe Thomas Jefferson 
as un-American, as more of a French revolutionary than an American revolutionary. The fact that Hamilton embraces for himself and his allies the term federalist is interesting because the Federalists, of course, in the 1780s had been people who were in support of the ratification of the Constitution, chief among them James Madison, as Hamilton well knew, and Thomas Jefferson as well. Um, now he's implying, Hamilton is, that Jefferson and Madison were somehow against the Constitution, opposed to the Constitution. Um, the charge of Jefferson being somehow un-American is answered um, by the Jeffersonian Republicans in, I think, a pretty convincing way, although it certainly didn't convince all the Federalists. Um, this this is when it became revealed that this corporate document, this document that Jefferson wrote for the Continental Congress, the Declaration of Independence, you know, was in fact drafted by Thomas Jefferson. Oh, they didn't know that. They didn't the, know. And and when you think that's about that's I've never heard that. So so when it was issued, it they never said who actually wrote it. Right. And he and he they brought it up in the 1790s as like a, a as to counter these un-American. Yeah, as, especially in the election of 1796. I think you could say that that's when many Americans first heard that Thomas Jefferson's hand drew the Declaration of Independence. Um, you know, Hamilton uh, and others were trying to charge that Jefferson was really a French revolutionary, a dangerous, radical French revolutionary. Um, what better response to that? Um, and, and what better way to establish his sort of American revolutionary chops than, than, than to take note that he, in fact, was the author of the Declaration of Independence. Increasingly, that word and that claim is going to be made. On this fight in the newspapers between Hamilton and Jefferson, um, we hear a lot today about how dirty and ugly politics is and how people are fighting with each other and they, we long for this return to win – things were better. And so is is politics, are these fights at the time like the charges of un-Americanism, is it better, more civil, more elevated back then? I I, I think uh, it's it would be difficult to sustain that that view. Um, one of the reasons that politics back then were were so dirty, I mean they were really dirty and they were really personal, um, is that so much seemed to be at stake. I mean, these were a number of people um, who, and, and I think Trevor, you're the one who used the word crazy. I mean, was it crazy um, to to declare independence from Great Britain? On one level, maybe it was, and yet they had done it, and, and at great risk um, to their lives and their fortunes, they had secured independence, and 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 yet now um, this experiment seemed. Uh, to be in danger of unraveling. Um, if you were a Federalist, you feared that the Jeffersonian Republicans were going to take us in a radical new direction along the lines of the French Revolution. If you were a Jeffersonian Republican, you feared that the Federalists were really crypto-monarchists, counter-revolutionaries who wanted to roll back um, you know, the, the, the clock to uh, before 1776 and model this new government under the Constitution after that of Great Britain. Um, so a lot was at stake. And this two-party system that uh, has existed in America for so long was then a very new thing. The Constitution did not anticipate um, partisanship. Uh, the legitimacy of partisanship was something that was very much um, up in the air. I think that that Jefferson didn't even consider himself to be a partisan. He, he thought that the Federalists were a party or a faction. Um, I think the Federalists considered the Jeffersonian Republicans to be a party or a faction. Um, but but everyone, every person considered himself to be a representative of, of America as a whole and the good of America as a whole. Well, you mentioned at the beginning that um, the people didn't run for office. They stood for office and then the public judged them not on I've got a set of policies I'm going to lay out but on their character. Um, and so did that – if we're going to judge people on their – candidates on their character, does that then – how does that play into the the dirtiness of it? Because if I'm going to attack your character, if I don't want you to win as opposed to saying as we might now ideally that you know the specific policies you'd like aren't going to be as effective. Absolutely. I mean you know it personalizes politics. It personalizes the charges against uh, – people who are put forth as candidates for office. One of the charges that was frequently made against Thomas Jefferson um, was that he was hostile to Christianity. 
that he was an atheist. Uh, and the evidence that, that Federalists had for this charge um, were some of Jefferson's own writings. He, he published a book called Notes on the State of Virginia. Um, and in that book, he makes arguments for religious toleration. Um, he argues, for example, that um, it does me no injury if my neighbor believes that there is no God or that there are 20 gods. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Uh, so we could read that as a, a classic statement of, you know, live and let live as long as someone else doesn't violate my rights. They have the right to do whatever they wish to do and believe whatever they wish to believe. But for Federalists, that's a radical statement. Um, to have such disregard for the souls of your countrymen, they said, um, was itself a very dangerous thing. And, uh, and of course, the French Revolution, um, which began as in many respects an anti-Catholic movement because the Catholic Church um, had been you know, in league with the French monarchy, um, spiraled into an anti-religious movement. Um, and so Jefferson's association with that, um, fairly or unfairly, seemed to bolster their claim that he was hostile to religion in America. And was also, he an atheist or at least a non-Christian? He, he, I think, can best be described as a deist in that he, he did believe in God. He did not seem to believe that God intervened in the affairs of man. You know, he questioned things like, here's another thing that got him in trouble. And his notes on the state of Virginia, he, he wrote about the story of Noah's Ark. And he calculated that if, you know, all the water vapor that was in the atmosphere um, somehow was converted into liquid, um, that it would raise sea levels, uh, you know, maybe a, a few dozen feet, but it wouldn't cover all of the mountains. It wouldn't cover the entire surface of the planet. Um, and again, I mean, this was viewed as sort of heretical stuff. Um, Jefferson described himself as a Christian, but he did it in a very idiosyncratic way. Uh, Jefferson said that he thought that Jesus was the greatest philosopher who ever lived. And later in his life, he wrote to his friend Benjamin Rush that uh, he subscribed to Jesus every human excellence, believing that he never claimed any other. Um, so Jefferson calls himself a Christian, but he seems to reject a pretty basic tenet of what most people would describe as the the foundational philosophy of Christianity, that, that Jesus is divine. As we're getting into the um, 1790s area, we were discussing and attacks and how politics was pretty, pretty vicious. Um, that seems like the right time to get into, especially in the 1790s and getting into the election of 1800 of – and right after that when the Sally Hemings allegations really start coming out. Uh, and, and I'm not sure if it's actually – True that James Callender is a, a pamphleteer. You can talk a little bit about a very strange, interesting guy, but was the first person who publicly raised these allegations that Jefferson had been sleeping with his young slave Sally Hemings, and uh, and uh, and I guess another sort of factor in this is I mean Jefferson's wife had died in. What year, what, what year did she die? I think it was 1780. 1780, was about, yeah. yeah. And he so, was about 40 years old when his, his wife uh, died. You know, Jefferson and his wife Martha had a, had a very, you know, so far as we can tell, a very intense, very loving marriage. Uh, in 10 years of marriage, she was pregnant six times. Um, and, uh, you know, we know that he was um, very much grief-stricken when she died. Uh, he soon thereafter accepted the appointment as our ambassador um, to France. I mean, he left for France. He first worked as Benjamin Franklin's understudy, and then eventually he was elevated to that post. And he brought Sally Hemings to France, correct? Yeah, basically that's correct. Uh, he first brought his eldest daughter, and he left his younger two daughters behind in Virginia. I said that his wife was pregnant six times. Not all those pregnancies were successful. And, you know, it was basically complications of, of childbirth that, that caused his wife to die, so, so far as we can tell. Um, but back in Virginia, um, his youngest daughter then died. And so Jefferson sees his family just falling apart and he wants to reunite what's left of it. So he writes home to uh, the relatives in Virginia who are watching after his surviving daughter in Virginia and he asks that she be sent to France. And by name, he requests an elderly enslaved woman to, to accompany her on the ocean voyage. But she's not available. She's ill. Um, and so uh, the family in Virginia decides that as a babysitter, they're going to send along Sally Hemings. Now, Sally Hemings has, uh, even before Thomas Jefferson is introduced into this story, she has an interesting connection to the Jefferson family. Sally Hemings is uh, Jefferson's late wife's half-sister. 
So relationships between black people and uh, white people, between white people and especially in enslaved black people they owned are not uncommon. They're not uncommon in Virginia. They're not uncommon wherever slavery exists. And so Jefferson's father-in-law, his late father-in-law is- who was, a, who was a Randolph, correct? Uh, uh, was, is that, was his for, what, the family for for Martha's was yeah she, Randolph is that her main they're, name? Well, they're all they're all Randolphs. Yeah, yeah, that, I guess, yeah that's a big Virginia name. So <laughs> his his his, uh, his his wife's father is uh, is John Wales. John and, Wales, okay, okay. And and John Wales uh, has a relationship it seems with Elizabeth Hemings, who is the mother of Sally Hemings. And Elizabeth Hemings herself um, is, according to the Hemings family and 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 their knowledge of their lineage, she is half white, half black. So Sally Hemings is three quarters white, um, one quarter black. Black. Um, she's Jefferson's late wife's half sister. Um, by some account, she resembles Jefferson's late wife. Um, his wife, uh, according to Jefferson's family, um, on her deathbed, asked Jefferson that he would never remarry. Um, in part because uh, John Wales did did remarry after his first wife died, uh, Martha's mother, and it seems as if she was not treated as well as. The, the daughters that that woman had through a previous marriage. Um, so is, that, she, is that apocryphal? You're saying like, that, that she asked him not to marry, or is that well? I mean, pr- it's, well it's a long-standing tradition, you know, that's documented within Jefferson's okay. white family, his, okay. his descendants. Um, so, you know, that if we if we accept that as a given, Jefferson's never going to remarry. Here comes along Sally Hemings, um, with whom it seems at some point he begins a relationship. He cannot legally marry Sally Hemings because she is legally black. Um, but maybe she resembles his wife. And certainly, you know, when we think about what interests Thomas Jefferson and what interests Thomas Jefferson um, ab- about women, he, he seems to like women who have an uncommon degree of sophistication. And I think a lot of people unfairly discount the degree of sophistication that Sally Hemings is able to gain while she's in France. Um, you know, most Virginia women, uh, white or black, slave or free, probably never go more than 20 miles from the place where they're born. Here is Sally Hemings, um, who's with Thomas Jefferson in, in Paris. Um, she is legally free while she's in France. Um, the relationship probably begins uh, while uh, she is with Thomas Jefferson in France. Um, is a, there's a little bit of uncertainty about when their first child is born because if they have a first child who's conceived in France, that child doesn't survive. Um, but, but the children that they do appear to have together – um, are born over the span of years, and it appears as if this is uh, an ongoing monogamous relationship. Thomas Jefferson, you know, was a very eligible bachelor. Um, you know, he he could have married lots of different women had he chosen to to break that pledge he had made to his wife. Um, the fact that he stuck with Sally Hemings, um, you know, I, I I think that 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 says something about um, the nature of of their relationship. And when did this become the? Discuss, uh, an item that was discussed by people of the day. Well, you brought up James Callender, yeah. and Callender's an interesting character. So he's he's born in Scotland. Uh, he comes over to America and is initially a Jeffersonian Republican. And he writes some very critical um, pieces against the administrations of both George Washington and John Adams. He is jailed under the Adams Administration Sedition Act. Um, when Jefferson becomes president, uh, he's, he's released. He believes that Jefferson owes him something more than just his freedom. He asks for a job as postmaster in Richmond, Virginia. Um, Jefferson denies him that job. Um, That's when he seems to turn his back on Thomas Jefferson and he starts writing in behalf of the Federalists. So it's uh, in September of 1802 that Calendar in a newspaper called the Richmond Recorder um, launches these these, uh, charges. He says um, that people in in the vicinity of Charlottesville have have long known that um, the man whom it delighteth the people to honor for many years, um, you know, has kept um, as his concubine one of his slaves. Her name is Sally. And those charges reverberated throughout the Federalist press. Um, Jefferson never really issued a response. Um, you know, silence was a pretty strong response. Um, he responded uh, also by returning to Washington, D.C. from Monticello. 
um, his two uh, surviving daughters um, soon joined him. Uh, Jefferson sometimes would miss church services before. He seemed never to miss them after, always with his daughters in tow. The presence of his daughters within, you know, the small society of the small fledgling capital of Washington, D.C., I think uh, put a damper on some of the gossip. And, uh, you know, in the election of 1804, it wasn't really a big issue. It was one that, that, that had passed. What should we today, looking back and judging Jefferson's legacy and his historical significance and knowing the words that he wrote in the declaration make of both the the Sally Hemings relationship but then more broadly his ownership of slaves sure i mean it's it's worth saying that it's difficult to know what to make of the Sally Hemings relationship because we don't know definitively what that relationship entailed. I mean, you know, master-slave relationships could quite easily be and oftentimes were rape. Um, a, a slave, you know, did not have the ability to refuse her master. Um, on the other hand— She was very young too when they started. Well, when she arrived in Paris, she was 14. We don't know exactly when their relationship began, but she was, you know, in her late teens, um, and there was a disparity in age. Although, again, you know, we shouldn't be too confused by our own modern sensibilities. When Madison was thirty-one years old, he was uh, engaged to a fifteen-year-old. So, and Madison married, and Dolly was seventeen years younger than him, I believe. Or that I that, think that may be the case. Yeah. yeah, the 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 fifteen year old he was engaged to essentially dumped him, mm -hmm. and and then you know later on he became engaged to Dolly Dolly Payne Madison. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, to whatever degree this relationship was consensual, the more consensual it was, the more uh, loving it was. Um, I, I think that might reflect well upon Thomas Jefferson. I mean, we know for a fact that Thomas Jefferson was a slaveholder. I don't think it gets much worse than that. If Thomas Jefferson actually had a capacity or developed a capacity um, to see very fully the humanity of someone like Sally Hemings, um, maybe even to feel some real affection for Sally Hemings, I think that would reflect well on him, not negatively. The fact that he was a slaveholder is, is for me, the thing that is, is maybe most uh, troubling. Um, and, and it's troubling for me in part because I have the good fortune to live in the 21st century. And Jefferson is a, a literal product of the 18th century. His first memory um, as a three-year-old is being carried on a pillow and looking up into the face of an enslaved man who was carrying him. I mean, it was a part of his life. It was a part of his family. It was a part of his world. Um, I wish that Jefferson did more to prioritize ending slavery. Um, but he at least did something. He did some things to try to uh, diminish the influence of slavery in, in Virginia and within the United States. I mean, as, as president, he uh, signed the law that ended the, the legal importation of new slaves from Africa. Um, as a member of Congress under the Articles of, Articles of Confederation, he proposed in his Ordinance of 1784 um, a provision that would ban slavery in all of the Western territory, all the territory west of the Appalachian Mountains, east of the Mississippi River from the Great Lakes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. If Jefferson had his way in 1784, slavery would not be allowed to take root there. Um, when he was uh, in Virginia, he proposed a bill for gradual emancipation that was defeated. His first public act, um, you know, as a freshman member of the House of Burgesses in 1769 was to co-sponsor a bill that would have made it legal to emancipate, uh, one, you know, your own slaves. Um, that, that wasn't allowed in Virginia until much later. So he did do some things, um, but did he do enough? And did he prioritize uh, slavery as highly as he should? I think that people of Jefferson's generation oftentimes compromise on slavery because they think it's more important first to secure independence from Great Britain. Um, then they'll compromise on slavery because they think it's more important to sustain the union. Um, they'll think it's more important to hold together their partisan alliance as they do battle against the Federalists. Um, they think it's more important um, to pursue other goals, and slavery is always this can that they seem to kick down the road. And, and a big thing looming over them that's very hard to just address in a very simple way. So, But by 
by the end of his life, though, do we know? I mean, by the last decade or so, or around the Missouri Compromise and things like this, did he see bad things coming? What, did, did he write anything about slavery in the 1820s or anything about sure. what was going to happen? Right. So uh, the Missouri Crisis, uh, you know, when the when many Northerners did not want to admit to the Union, Missouri, which was applying for admission as a slave state. Jefferson wrote uh, that he saw that it, as it was like a fire bell in the night. Um, and think about, you know, in the 18th or early 19th century, how terrifying a fire bell, a fire alarm in the night would be. I mean, you know, this is a world made of wood. Um, and, and we don't have modern fire departments uh, that are going to rush to the scene. Um, you know, this, he thought, was the knell of the Union, the death knell of the Union. There, there's, there's some uh, question about the degree to which Jefferson was sincere in statements like that. At the same time that the Missouri crisis is unfolding, Jefferson is trying to establish um, in Virginia a university, um, you know, what would become the University of Virginia. And Jefferson oftentimes writes to Virginians uh, letters that make panicked pronouncements about the dangers of sectionalism. One of the arguments that he makes for the University of Virginia is that we're sending our, our sons to these northern seminaries, to Harvard and Yale, and, you know, our children are developing these Yankee principles. When he writes to people who aren't Virginians, um, when he writes to people in other states, and especially when he writes to foreigners, he tends to minimize these sectional differences and describe them as, you know, ripples on the sea of liberty. So there's, there's some question about exactly what Jefferson thought and how panicked he truly was. But certainly sectionalism was a rising problem and it was one that that troubled him. After his presidency, uh, which is is interesting presidency, it's, it, it, he has the Louisiana Purchase, which of course is quite a huge deal to say the least. Um, he also – I think strangely embargoes most of New England, uh, which, right. <laughs> which is probably a bad idea, thinking that he can hurt the British by making it illegal for New England to trade with the British, which is – but it, it's it's interesting. But he, does he just go home then um, after – in 1808 and just kind of retire from public – does he ever do a public life thing again after 1808? So he, he retires under the – truly the best of circumstances because James Madison, who has been his you know key ally, his best political friend, um, you know, their relationship begins in 1776. Um, you know, he is able to pass the baton to James Madison, um, his successor. Uh, when Madison is inaugurated um, on March 4th, 1809, uh, there's a reception afterwards that Jefferson attends. And um, Jefferson uh, was friends with a woman named Margaret Baird Smith, who was the wife of Samuel Harrison Smith, who was the editor of the Jeffersonian Republican National Intelligencer, the big newspaper in D.C. at the time. And uh, – you know, according to Margaret Baird Smith, Jefferson uh, had a big smile on his face, um, and she said to Jefferson, "You know, you you look like a, a man much relieved." Um, and his response was, "Yes, I am." And at this moment, I am much much happier than my friend. So, you know, <laughs> Madison was was the one who got to assume this burden, and I think Jefferson really tried to respect Madison's independence, and he had a lot of trust in James Madison, as as well he should have. Did Jefferson have a sense of his historical significance? I, th I think he did. I, I think you know one of the things that you perhaps noticed when you visited Monticello um, and when you stood in the uh, suite of rooms that uh, Jefferson called his sanctum sanctorum. You know, it's his library and his office and his bedchamber. Um, you see on his desk this really neat contrivance, this machine uh, that he called a polygraph. And essentially, um, it allows him to make copies of his letters. You write with one pen and then it's connected to another pen um, through a series of, of, of pulleys and uh, it makes an exact duplication of the uh, letter that Jefferson would write. And he did that because, you know, if you didn't have a copy, you, you, when you sent your correspondence out, you'd lose it forever. Um, but he was able to keep his correspondence, not only the letters that he received, but also copies of the letters that he sent. And I think he did that in part because he understood his place in history. He understood that he was central to this American experiment, um, that he was a central figure in the revolutionary project. Um, and I think he hoped at least that uh, future generations would, would take great interest in uh, the revolutionary generation and the, uh, the nation that they established. What kind of 
lessons – I mean for you having studied Jefferson so much um, and admired him so much, what kind of lessons do you think we can learn individually and even maybe as a nation from – him. So, yeah, I think it's fair to say that I do admire Thomas Jefferson on many levels. But, um, but I'll, I'll say this: the more you study Thomas Jefferson, the more you study anyone, the more you realize that they are flawed uh, people. And uh, Thomas Jefferson wasn't perfect. I'm not sure that Thomas Jefferson always made the right decision. Um, but, but I do believe that Thomas Jefferson carefully weighed his decisions. He tried to do what was right. He tried to do his best. Um, and, you know, he lived in an imperfect world and he dealt with a number of different challenges. And a lot of times he found that his principles were in, were in conflict. I mean, you mentioned Louisiana and the embargo. The Louisiana Purchase uh, is a fantastic opportunity for America to double the size of the country um, without firing a shot. Um, and yet the Constitution doesn't contain a provision that allows the national government to add new territory. Um, if, if that's the case, how, how do you do this the right way? I mean, Jefferson thought about it. He drafted a constitutional amendment that would explicitly authorize the purchase of Louisiana. Albert Gallatin, his treasury secretary, James Madison, his secretary of state, ultimately talked him out of it. They said, look, uh, we, we appreciate your constitutional scruples. We share them. But if we delay this, if, if, if France reneges on this deal, if it's not authorized by three quarters of the states, this opportunity will be lost forever. And this is an opportunity not only to double American territory, this is an opportunity um, to keep, they thought, they hoped, America at peace. Just as the Atlantic Ocean was a moat separating us from the troubles of Europe, this would be a land moat in the West that would insulate us from invasion and international strife. And this land would allow our nation, which was doubling in population every 20 years, um, to continue on as a nation of you know, virtuous farmers who were their own bosses, who were self-sufficient, self-reliant. So there was a lot of good arguing for Louisiana. Um, but then there was the Constitution. And Jefferson, I think, ultimately, he had to swallow hard and make the best decision that he could. Um, so I appreciate the fact that he truly grapples with, with those decisions. Um, again, maybe he made the right choice. Maybe he made the wrong one. Um, but he was very thoughtful about how he made it. And in Jefferson's last years too, the um, – something we hadn't brought up actually was the uh, – Jefferson Adams' correspondence, which is a, a, an interesting. Yes, I, I assume you read most of those or a lot of those letters. There uh, are a lot of letters to read. I'll tell yeah, you that. Yeah, and, and, but they're fun to read because um, Jefferson and Adams write about all the things that we're not supposed to discuss. Right? We're not supposed to talk about you know politics or religion or, or what have you. And they talked about all of it. And they talked about history. And they talked about the future. And uh, you know these guys are classic sort of frenemies. They were close allies in the Continental Congress. They were, um, you know, friends as understudies to, to Benjamin Franklin in, in France as diplomats. Um, their relationship came under great strain. You know, during the partisanship of the 1790s, they were opponents in the elections of 1796 and 1800. Um, when Jefferson was inaugurated, Adams left town the night before. Um, wasn't even present for Jefferson's inauguration. Um, but they patched up their relationship and resumed their correspondence after Jefferson retired from office. And uh, I think, I think they, they saw their, their uh, attempt to reunite and reconcile um, not only as a way to uh, validate their friendship, but also to validate the American Union, um, to validate the, the, the fact that people from the North and people from the South could rally around a shared cause of liberty. And I think it's fair to say, too, that, um, you know, they were writing to each other, but they knew that they were preserving their letters. I think, you know, it's fair to say that they, they knew that they'd be writing to us as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I recommend that people read their letters. They're really, they're really great. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Mark McDaniel and Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.